So welcome to the Museum of Chinese in America. This is a building tucked between Center Street and Lafayette Street, right at the very border of Chinatown. Chinatown is all this way. You can already start seeing all the, the lettering on the storefronts. But what I really love about this museum is that you really get an in-depth look at the life of Chinese Americans, which is something not frequently talked about neither in the textbooks or in the media. And this is a gorgeous building also redesigned by Maya Lin, who's a renowned Chinese American architect. So let's take a look inside, shall we? And here we are at the core exhibition where we're gonna learn the majority of Chinese American history. I have Andrew Rubata, who is the assistant creator of this museum. So tell me, what are we looking at here? We're seeing the, the general history sure. of Chinese in America. Yeah, this yeah. is the um, first section of our core exhibition, which chronicles the Chinese American experience here in the US. Mm. Um, so this first section kind of looks at some of the push-pull factors of uh, what attracted um, Chinese migrants to arrive here. Um, and on this wall, we see representations of what life was like in China, some of the push factors, such as like the over Korean here. War. Yeah. yeah, up there. Mm -hmm. um, but we also see, um, you know, uh, a photograph of uh, the Golden Spike, um, which Ooh. was the... Which one is that one? It's this one right over here. Mm -hmm. um, and is, can you tell me something about, like, that you notice right off Let the bat see. about this photo? Let me see. Let's see it. Um, well, I do know that Chinese worked in the railroads and also African Americans, but I'm not seeing either. Yeah, yeah. so in this image, this was the image of like the last spike or the last um, link within <laughs> like the train um, line that was, um, you know, finally like east and west was united in that sense. Um, but in this image, there are no Chinese folks, even though, you know, Chinese are known for building a good chunk of this railroad. Oh, wow. Um, it's been said that they were asked to not um, be included in, in this photo. But, um, but I think, you know, there is some uh, uh, historical revisionism around that. So, yeah. But I'm not sure. But that's the way we kind of perceive it to be today. Mm, I see. That's a, such, such a shame to see that work go unrecognized. Mm -hmm. And then um, this one really sticks out to me. What was this guy over here? Oh, so this <laughs> is more just, um, you know, people d trying to figure out how they were going to divide China or uh. colonize China. And behind them is a very stereotypical image yeah. of, you know, um, of a Chinese person maybe representing China itself. Mm, which we saw in many American comics and, yeah. and uh, media. Yeah, and you, you still see that stereotype um, showing up every now and again mm. today. And how about all around here? We see, we're seeing a few stories and names. Yes, yeah. yes. so these are all um, individuals who during this time period made some sort of great contribution to, mm. to the United States. Um, we have farmers, um, we have people who've like even bred new types of vegetables and fruits. Ooh, like um, whom? Who um, do we see so here that was a farmer? The potato farmer here, Chen Lung, known Chen as the Chinese Lung. Potato King. The Chinese Potato King, oh cool. Oh yeah. So he brought vegetables over from China and started growing um, them here. No, I want to say that um, he basically arrived and realized that, um, you know, became familiar with what grows here in the U.S. Yeah. and focused on potatoes. And, um, you know, here, like, it even mentions that because of the alien land laws in the 1920s, he was actually forced to sell his land. Oh, wow. Um, because that was during the exclusion era, mm. uh, which began in 1882, which was, um, you could say, uh, the, Ch the Chinese Exclusion Act was the first... Um, legislation enacted that targeted a specific race or nationality. Okay, so we're, we're gonna get to that little piece of fact to the next room. Let's head over here. So Andrew, you were talking about the Chinese Exclusion Act. Mm -hmm. uh, what was that? So the Chinese <laughs> Exclusion Act was um, legislation that um, focused on Chinese as a group of mm -hmm. immigrants who were yeah. arriving here. And basically, which we're seeing them persecuted here. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's some of the um, anti-Chinese sort of propaganda that was coming up at the time. Mm. Um, but the and Chinese Exclusion Act, um, even though it's called exclusion, that's not completely true um, because the U.S. didn't want to sever economic ties with China. Yeah. Um, the U.S. was in, in limited numbers, was allowing um, merchants, um, students, and scholars 
um, to enter into this country so they can study and just to, to maintain an open relationship in that sense with China. Oh, but we wanted to limit the number of like actual workers and other immigrants. Because we were still getting goods from China at that time. Yes, yes. Mm. yes. And th these, this is one of the posters that really ignited the Exclusion Act here in America. Um, yes, yeah. yes. So, you know, um, at the time, uh, there was a lot of organizing, particularly on the West Coast, mm -hmm. um, where, you know, after the California gold rush, after those gold deposits kind of dried up, and as like people continued to kind of migrate to the Northwest and a little bit eastward to places like Idaho and Oregon, yeah. um, more and more anti-Chinese propaganda or um, broadsides and other kind of ephemera was, was um, being created and, and circulated. Oh, wow. And it, it, for, so it reads Chinese, no, 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 mm -hmm. and they're setting up a meeting in order to... Yeah. The, Talk about the Chinese question. Yeah, mm. so there was a lot of organizing yeah. around um, Chinese who, yeah. you know, um, were also often cheaper labor, mm -hmm. um, which is why a lot of these sort of non-Chinese groups were also kind of like um, protesting about that. Oh, cool. Okay. All right. Now here, there's something. There's a chair. Yeah. What does this chair do? Okay. So we talked about the Exclusion Act. So yeah. During the Exclusion Era, um, Chinese were still arriving in the U.S., um, but they were arriving at a place called Angel Island, which is the equivalent Ooh. of like an Ellis Island, but on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. um, unlike Ellis Island, Angel Island was, you could say, more to keep people out. Oh, and wow. one of the ways they would do that um, was to ask um, very tough questions in an interrogation setting. And so when you sit in this chair, All right. um, I'm gonna you'll do hear it. questions that are intended to stump um, the person immigrating here okay. to have them kind of prove the sort of validity or truth of their um, immigration sort of paperwork and applications. So uh, right now I'm hearing a guy speaking English. If I were to put myself in the position, would a Chinese person at that time, yes. mostly Chinese men mm -hmm. at that time, would he know uh, um, English? So after a little while, um, well the answer to that is no, but no, after a okay. little while they became more familiar with the questions. But as the questions um, pe as people began to more easily sort of like yeah. study for these questions and become accustomed to them, the questions became actually more difficult over time. Oh wow, that's such a shame. Uh, and then here we see a, a few more photos of um, Angel Island. Um, yeah, so this gives you an idea of what the facility looked like. Yeah. But also this section calls um, attention to a certain phenomenon that was happening during the exclusion era, which is called the paper suns phenomenon which also contributed to the increased sort of um, difficulty of questioning mm -hmm. um, that was happening during the interrogations. Um, what we mean by paper sons is, is that since you can only get a limited number of people into this country from China, a lot of people were sending their sons, um, or like, uh, yeah, their sons are the men. And, but what, was also, what also happened that kind of led to this mm -hmm. was, after a, a earthquake in San Francisco in the early 20th century, a lot of, uh, one of the buildings that held all the records for Chinese immigrants burned down. Oh, so this no. also gave an opportunity to, you know, in some ways falsify people's identities yeah. to get them to this country. But that's not to say that, you know, there was a flood of Chinese, you know, it was just more so they noticed that people were sending a lot of their sons here. Mm. And that caused the Chinese to really make their communities a lot stronger. Um, yeah, yes. you know, I think for a lot of the Chinese communities, particularly in the West Coast, there was such anti-Chinese sentiment at the time mm -hmm. that they were kind of forced into their own neighborhoods, um, you know, for their own safety. Um, and then later on, we see um, as like Chinese remained, yeah. um, they tried to figure out different ways of making a living. And that's what mm -hmm. some of these other sections address. Okay, let's go to them right now. All right, so Andrew, you were talking about how Chinese American culture started uh, doing different jobs in order not to compete with the Irishmen mm -hmm. uh, of America. Uh, what were they? Um, you know, initially, like hand laundries yeah. became very popular. Um, that was often seen as uh, women's work, but since mm -hmm. there was mainly men here and there was a need for that, particularly on the West Coast, you know, where these sort of mining towns were, um, they took that on as, um, you know, a service kind of um, industry. And, mm. you know, other than that, I would say one of the things we're most known for are yeah. opening Chinese restaurants. Ooh, which we see right over yeah. here. And, yeah. um, All the and, menus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
and that has also a lot to do with um, exclusion laws, actually. Mm. I mentioned earlier that merchants were allowed to immigrate here. Oh. And with Chinese restaurants, often you have multiple owners. So that actually provided um, an entry point for many Chinese to come into this country as business owners, even though there were groups of business owners that owned each restaurant. Um, and because, you know... Well, let's, uh, let's actually point out something specific here. So, we, so we're seeing uh, here a, a menu, and we're seeing mm -hmm. uh, plates like chow mein, lo mein, mm -hmm. chop mm -hmm. suey. Yeah. yeah. yeah and things, they'll start in San Francisco yeah, originally. Yeah, things they were, yeah. things they were creating to um, sort of satisfy local tastes and flavors. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you'll notice here on, to the right of these menus, there are a number of postcards. Because Ooh, so cool. Chinese realized, you know, yeah. um, that we needed to attract people to come eat at our restaurants and that so a lot of these sort of things that seem so stereotypical yeah. to a certain degree at this time we were playing them up oh. um, in order to get people to come and and be interested in sort of like being in this chinese sort of space and even the architecture oh yeah, yeah. and so colorful of, buildings so a lot of these raised eaves and, and yeah. um you know these elements that scream Chinatown. Yeah. Um, they weren't necessarily created by architects back then. Um, often they were artisans who came in and oh, actually created these things. So until like you know, I'd say pretty recently, just within the past few decades, there are still like there have been artisans who come in and, and create these forms to kind of um, like uh, mm. give these kind of Chinese accents to the neighborhood. That's so cool. And then uh, over here we see a little bit more. Uh, Oh, can, uh, when they were selling canned goods for, for Chinese yeah, food. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah so huh. now we see huh. Chinese food entering the domestic space, entering yeah. the home. Huh. Um, but what's funny about Le Choy is, I think I believe it says it in the label, that it was actually started by a Korean person. Oh, cool. Um, so, you know, again, yeah. like... Just like the fortune cookie started by the Japanese. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Oh, wow. So we see somebody huh. who sees a market for something and huh. sort of takes advantage huh. um, and actually provides a pretty solid living for them and many others. Interesting. And then one thing that really sticks out to me here is the posters of uh, Fu Manchu mm -hmm. and all these other Chinese villains at the mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. Uh, so these were very like very strong stereotypes. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. and often you know these are a really strong example of yellow face. Mm, oh no! Some, uh, so this is not person. a Chinese American actor. That's right. That's this, right. Yeah. So you know, this is Christopher Lee. There we mm -hmm. go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So unlike the Chinese restaurants, where we kind of played up certain stereotypical aspects of what we of uh, what we think people expect yeah. of Chinese. In this case, we see Hollywood sort of. Um, fabricating or creating different kinds of stereotypes, mm. you know, but also very like binary in terms of like, you know, here we have the evil kind of scientist, yeah. but then we also have Charlie Chan, this kind of like oh. honorable, you know, logical like uh, detective. Detective, yeah. Say. Mm -hmm. Who's willing to go into the seedy underground of what was Chinatown perceived back then. That's right, huh. that's right. All right, now let's go a little bit further into the future and see how. Uh, Chinese American culture developed. So America's not short on very famous Chinese Americans. <laughs> uh, like namely, for example, Ang Lee director. Uh, who are the other highlights here? Um, for me, one of the highlights who is well known to the theater world yeah. um, and is a recent addition to this wall is Ming Cho Lee. Mm, Ming yeah. Cho Lee, okay. So we actually had a retrospective exhibition of his a couple of years ago where we exhibited all of his theater set designs and he became known for having an avant-garde style mm -hmm. so very much a trailblazer in that in that sort of sphere well, that's cool and then a few other highlights is Maya Lin who made the interiors of this space <laughs> beautiful uh, Yo-Yo Ma world-renowned cellist uh -huh. and Bruce Lee world-renowned actor mm -hmm. and also philosopher yeah, I, I'm personally uh, subscribed to his philosophy. <laughs> and uh, here, we, what are we looking at here, this okay, area? So just this past year, what we did was um, we updated this, this part of the exhibition. So yeah. the exhibition used to end in that area in 1979. Hmm. We added a section um, that looked at the 1980s mm. and some of the sort of um, uh, like the labor movement with the um, uh, uh, garment workers, you know, marching on Mott Street. Oh yeah, um, wow. As well okay. as what some people consider the height of the Asian American movement, which happened after the murder of Vincent Chin, mm. where there was more of a pan-Asian kind of identity forming. 
and people from all communities nationally um, coming together and organizing um, on his behalf. Mm, I see. And then uh, here we see the modern Chinatowns yes, of yes. Sunset Park, so, Monterey so, Park. So this section yeah. kind of looks at two case studies, yeah. um, two different ways that neighborhoods develop. Mm. Um, for example, Monterey Park on the West Coast mm -hmm. was began um, a Taiwanese uh, real estate developer actually began the development of Ty uh, Monterey Park and attracted um, people from Taiwan and Hong Kong to move there. Um, so we see this other more like uh, appeal to more affluent individuals yeah. to get them to move to the U.S. and to live in a suburban setting. So we often think of Chinatowns forming always beginning in a Chinatown, right? In yeah. an urban setting. Out of necessity. In this case, yeah. we have a suburban example, what they call America's first, first ethnoburb. Interesting. Fascinating. And uh. the other case study is more local in New York's New York Sunset Park, which yes. is in Brooklyn. Um, we looked at this model more as um, what happens when an immigrant group revitalizes an urban area that's been more or less desolate for a long time. Um, and also looking at this... And they came here before before really gentrification took hold in Sunset Park. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, we saw the Fujinese beginning to move into that neighborhood in the mid-1980s. Wow. Um, okay. And before then, there were um, some Cantonese folks moving in because they were getting priced out of Chinatown as well. Mm. So even that process of gentrification, to a certain degree, you know, began like far long before where the debate right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, the, I guess the other thing to maybe add about this is um, if you can, if, if you visit and look at this shot. Um, this is 8th Avenue in Brooklyn. Yeah. Um, oh, I see it. Yeah. So it's very like it's hustling, it's bustling. Every storefront has a business. Um, but in 1980, right before Chinese started moving into the neighborhood, 90% of those storefronts were vacant. Mm, I remember that as a child uh, growing up in New York City. Uh, seeing Sunset Park as like one of the worst areas in New York City. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, no, it's um, just a, another great example of revitalization, but also of dispersion within an within an area. Yeah. So, to a large degree, people were being priced out of Chinatown, but to another, they they wanted more space. Oh, I you know, see. They wanted to live in a different area, perhaps you know that wasn't as um, maybe busy or congested. Um, mm. So people were moving to places like Sunset Park, like places like Flushing. Elmhurst, Queens, and so forth. And all over America. Yeah. <laughs> and now let's look at the full, uh, Fold, which is the special exhibition right now, and learn about the more modern Chinese immigrants. So Andrew, what are we looking at here? Um, so what you see are paper sculptures that were created by mm. detained Chinese migrants um, who were primarily asylum seekers. Mm. Um, yeah, so they were detained between 1993 and 1997, um, but that wasn't the first part of what ended up being quite a traumatic journey. Yeah. Um, the ship that they rode was called the Golden Venture, which also ended up being um, almost like a moniker for the group, hmm. Golden Venture Passengers, Golden Venture Refugees. And you can see in the artwork, they even identify like that as well. Um, but the ship, um, this one that you see right here. Oh, this is the Golden Venture. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, each passenger, and there were 286, um, paid $30,000 ahead, or promised $30,000. Maybe they made a down payment yeah. to get on, and then they would pay the debt off through um, what would more or less be indentured servitude once they arrive in the U.S. as undocumented oh, wow. immigrants. Um, but. You know, basically, basically refugees. They're basically refugees, yeah. yes. And hmm. um, most people would describe them as such, but um, with some historical distance, you know, we've noticed that not all of them um, could qualify as refugees or asylum seekers. Yeah. Um, some were just simply economic migrants. Mm, um, I see. But for the most hmm. part, they were from a region that you could say, um, you know, modernized quite a bit, but this is the population that was kind of left out of that equation oh. with new jobs. And um, but so they the, came in the ship all the way yes. to where in New um, York City? So, so the ship um, began, uh, sailed from Bangkok. So mm -hmm. these individuals were primarily from Fujian province, China, mm -hmm. had to somehow make it down to Bangkok where they got on the ship. And then over three months, 
they had a stop in Kenya where they picked up more passengers and then went around the Cape of Good Hope and ended up running around here in Queens, wow. not that far from the Statue of Liberty in Rockaway Beach. Quite a journey. That's oh quite God. a journey. Yeah. Um, and, um, you know, upon arriving, um, you know, they ran aground because there was a mutiny on board with mm. the, the crew. And some of them began jumping in the water to try to reach shore. Um, Ten people passed away. Um, some drowned, some went into cardiac arrest because of the cold water and they were so emaciated because they only subsisted on a bowl mm. of rice a day is what I've been told. Um, mm, and really so, so tight, sad. terrible yeah. conditions in the hull of that ship. Oh, that's so sad. And the ones that survived end up uh, making this. Yeah, yeah, so some of them, yeah. So mm. the 286, mm -hmm. um, you know, about 100 were deported or voluntarily went back to China after being apprehended. Um, and then a hundred were sent, the majority of, the, of whoever was left, uh, was sent to York County, Pennsylvania, which mm. is a prison, uh, prison in central Pennsylvania that also has an immigration detention wing. A mm. um, hundred were sent there, and those are the, the individuals, all men, who created all the sculptures oh, this, in this room. Wow, especially this one. Yeah. This is the one of the most breathtaking oh, yeah. ones. This one actually yeah. has an internal staircase. Wow. So, you know, equally as impressive as the other pagoda, oh, but there. this yeah. you can really tell um, there is something different about what you would, you know, maybe like a different, you know, often we think of undocumented people as arriving here with not that many skills. Yeah. That is very much not the truth. And that's what you see in a lot of these sculptures, particularly this one, because um, these all, most of these sculptures that you see with folded um, units, mm were collectively created. Mm, I see. So they were created by, some people were less artistically inclined, and so they would focus on folding or rolling. Oh. Um, but there were a handful of creatives on board the ship. Um, one person was actually a theater set designer. Oh, so, so he designed this? So that is fascinating, that yeah. Some individuals were very much design-oriented. Yeah. There's also a landscape architect. Um, With the gardens in the yeah, back. Yeah, so you can yeah. just tell by like how beautiful <laughs> the gardens are planned. Um, you almost feel like you could walk through this piece. And yeah. sometimes I dream of walking through it. <laughs> um, wow. But there's also a lot of other symbolisms. Um, you know, most of these sculptures, I would say, have this hybridity to them where they're <laughs> often Chinese forms with like American content. Mm. Um, this one in particular has a American flag on top mm. and an acknowledgement of the sort of religious affiliations of, of the group that was helping them while they were being detained. So during their detention, um, in central Pennsylvania, um, a group, a diverse group of individuals, um, everybody from, you know, a stay-at-home parent mm. um, to truck drivers, to attorneys, to school teachers, um, to new age sort of philosophy followers, <laughs> yeah. um, banded together. Folks who would, would never be in the same room together, banded together to help these individuals. And that's wow. why these sculptures are actually able to circulate because they learned that the men were creating these small sculptures of folded paper and then they started to encourage them to create more so that they can take them out of the prison and sell them at fundraisers, put them on exhibition mm -hmm. and raise awareness of their story. And that's good. That's beautiful. Oh wow. What is this? So this is our general store. Uh -huh. So it's intended to look more or less like a recreation, although, you know, there are some photos <laughs> of different general stores from the Ooh. era, um, as well as some sort of like ephemera and artifacts from those general stores that were donated or went to the museum. So that, those were one of the businesses alongside food and, uh, oh, yeah. and yeah. dry cleaning. And what's yeah. really important about the general store mm. is that you didn't just go to them to buy um, imported goods yeah. um, or like ingredients. Mm. Um, you'd go there, you'd use them as your local post office to send letters back to China. Maybe you're sending money back to, to your family. Um, you would use them oh, sometimes as a travel agency, which you'll notice Ooh, right from, here. from here. Sometimes they were almost like banks, which is why we have the abacus here to kind of illustrate that history. Oh, which was used uh, for accounting purposes? Mm -hmm. oh. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oh, and I see a Chinese copy of How to Win Friends and Influence People. Oh, yes. <laughs> that yes. is cool. <laughs> a book that was written by Dale Carnegie, so I assume Chinese uh, <laughs> business entrepreneurs were moving ahead at that time. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, you'd also buy medicines. Mm. Um, Which we see, like, depicted here. Yeah, 
yeah. canned goods, and uh, and even this entire cabinet here um, yeah. that goes from uh, floor to ceiling, mm -hmm. I want to say was uh, donated to us and repurposed mm. um, from an existing cabinet from an old general store. Oh, I see. So um, I want to say it was the uh, Marcella Deers family, who's yeah. a big supporter of the museum. Um, her family owned the general store, and that's where this cabinetry came. Oh, beautiful, and lots of gorgeous uh, ceramics. Mm -hmm. mm, wow. Oh, wow, okay, there's a lot here to see in this room. Um, but I, I know that in Chinatowns all around America, there was uh, always a Chinatown opera house. Mm -hmm. um, so this is something that was used in those opera yeah. houses, right? Yeah. yeah. So this is a Cantonese opera costume, yeah. you know, um, a lot of the early immigrants from China were from southern China, from a lot of them uh, of Cantis, Cantonese descent. Oh, I see. And um, they would have these opera, like, sort of events, um, and... Uh, that were opera, very, like, familial. Yeah, and, yeah, they were uh, important social uh, space, you know, uh, people can gather, um, see each other, but also through the performance, um, learn a bit about current events in China going on at the time. Mm. And uh, there was, it was the equivalent of kind of like, you know, an American baseball game for a lot of people. <laughs> That's so cool. And then also all candlelit. Yes, And they yes. use these tiny little mirrors. Yeah, so yeah. throughout um, this costume, you'll notice these little mirrors. Um, they add to the drama, but also, yeah, like give you a little bit more re reflectivity and light oh, and space. Oh, wow. So cool. And you can also tell that from the side that it's reversible. It's reversible. So, um, yeah, it's like Easy this really costume intricate, change. very intricate costume um, that's two-sided. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of theatrics... Boom, we have a huge lion's head here. Yes. What is this guy? Um, so this is donated to us from one of the um, like uh, lion dance groups here yeah. in Chinatown. Um, and you know, L uh, Lunar New Year is coming up soon. Hmm. Um, so you'll see a lot more. What day is that? Um, I want to say it's in January. In January, So cool. yeah, um, you'll see a lot more of that around Chinatown. Um, maybe at Chinese restaurants as well, with uh, a group of uh, young men dancing inside of it. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and often people will throw money into its mouth, mm -hmm. and that money will be donated to the group that's leading these dances to help sustain them. Various associations in, in the Chinatowns. Yes. yes. Uh, that's really cool. So if, you, if you're here around January, be sure to check out the yeah, Chinese we'll have, we'll have a full New, New Year programming here at the museum. Oh, so that's cool. In January and February. So that's amazing. Stop by. And here's a gorgeous painting. Uh, to me, it looks like something from the Song Dynasty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is a painting by Tyrus Wong, okay. um, who, you know, is, is responsible for creating the visual aesthetic of Bambi. Ooh, so the Bambi, Walt Disney film. Yes, yes. Oh, so it's wow. a very American film. Actually, has a That's Chinese aesthetic. Yeah. And this particular painting was created during a time when he was recently out of uh, art school mm -hmm. and actually became part of uh, an Asian American kind of art collective. Um, and this whole section are just mm -hmm. around us with the yeah. New Year and the Cantonese Opera yeah. and the associations um, to the adjacent to that. It's all about community building and how we're, we uh, Chinese people came together to build community. That's amazing. Andrew, thank you so much yeah, no for problem. showing me around. Yeah, no